Good morning. morning. Wonderful to see everyone this morning. Our Sunday school is going fine. The children outside able to distance and inside. So that's working out well. I woke up this morning, looked out the window and saw the blue skies, thought, good, we're, we're on for Sunday school. I told Melissa, you know, if it ever gets cloudy and it looks like it's going to rain, we'll have to call everybody real quick and cancel. And then what was it? I took a shower after doing all my chores and I walked out and it was cloudy. I thought, oh no. <laughs> I looked at it, didn't see anything, anything in the forecast. So 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn there with me, chapter 2, I'm going to be looking at verses 10 through 16 this morning. Thank you, Stephen, for that call to worship. I, uh, it did teach the idea that you spoke of, that God is in control, all the way down to the little rock badgers and, and uh, everything, caring for them. I saw a picture as I was driving through downtown the other day, uh, down on Truman Road, of uh, a mural on the side of a building. Someone had painted a sparrow, uh, a male sparrow, you know. And I looked at it and I thought, that was an interesting choice. Most common of birds, almost like a mouse with wings, you know. I mean, this is a, a bird that's kind of a pest, but it made me think that God watches and sees every sparrow that falls. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Sorry, I just, I just now thought of that. I thought that was an interesting choice of a bird. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16 this morning. Also be uh, uh, in readiness for the Lord's Supper. If you haven't uh, picked up one of the little communion cups back there, uh, you might make your way back there sometime to do that. Get some for your family, those around you. And don't forget, I'm sorry, I know it's tricky, that, that little, if you look at it, that little piece of plastic on top unveils the wafer, and then you peel the rest of it, and you have the juice. So, it's kind of tricky. First time I was, I opened it up, and I was looking for the wafer. Yeah. But, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But let's back up, and let's read 6 through 16. This morning, though, we will be looking only at verses 10 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things, our text, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also one comprehends the thoughts of God. I'm sorry. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word that You've given to us this morning. We thank You uh, that it has been preserved for us, uh, carefully protected, so that we have the words that were written, the words that were inspired by You. We thank You for the teaching that we see here this morning, uh, a teaching on revelation and inspiration and illumination how your word your truth the gospel has been preserved and handed down to us we pray father as we look at these words that you will do just that illumine us and illumine our eyes open our eyes illumine the text illuminate us 
Help us to understand. And Father, help that understanding to change us, to change the way we walk, the way we live. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week, I, uh, I did not want to separate this text, uh, verses 10 through 16, from those that came before it. But if you look back up there and just think along with me as far as what we looked at last week, our, our text last week, verses 6 through 9, pressed home the idea that wisdom from God, which includes the wonderful gospel message of salvation in Christ by faith in Him and His work, that, that wisdom which is far superior, looking back again at last week, far superior to the world's wisdom that the Corinthians were so infatuated with that that wisdom from God we saw is not human wisdom, verses 6 and 7. And it is not humanly perceived wisdom, verses 8 and 9. And we just barely touched on, on verse 10, but we did. But God has revealed this wisdom to us through the Spirit. Think about this. So far, Paul has only mentioned the Holy Spirit one time in his letter. But in verses 10 through 14, this gives us a, a preview of what's coming. In verses 10 through 14, Paul refers to and speaks of the Holy Spirit six times. Six times. It is the Spirit, it is the, the Holy Spirit that reveals to us God's wisdom. And in verses 10 through 16, Paul proceeds to explain the three successive steps in the transmission of God's wisdom from, from the heart of God to the heart of man. The three steps revelation, inspiration, and illumination. This wisdom, again, tying this in with what we looked at last week, this wisdom that is not of this age, nor accepted by the wise of this age, the trendsetters, the rulers, who are all passing away. This wisdom decreed by God from the foundations of the earth for our glory, for our blessing. This wisdom not understood by the rulers of this age. These things, see verse 10, God has revealed to us. Through His Spirit. What a blessing. Things we cannot see. Things we cannot comprehend. Things we, we cannot, using our normal powers of perception, grasp. God has, in love, revealed them to us. A while back, in Sunday school, we watched a video. I think it was over two or three weeks called The American Gospel. It was a documentary on the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. And it highlighted several uh, prominent preachers uh, peddling this uh, false gospel that the good news, according to them, is, is not salvation from your sins and being reunited with God, reconciled to God, but it is that God wants you to be healthy and He wants you to be wealthy and He wants you to be happy. So it was a very good series dealing with that, pointing out several of the people and showing several of the things they had said. One of these was a rising star named Todd White. I had a customer, I think I've, I've told you, a customer of mine, his wife, asked him to ask me, well, what do you think of Todd White? And I had never even heard of Todd White. And I said, I don't know, I'll check him out. So I went out to the car and watched several YouTubes of him speaking and found out that he was hanging around with this crowd, a very dangerous crowd, uh, teaching heresy, but also noticed that he didn't really say anything that I could say that's wrong, but he was definitely in the wrong crowd. And then as I began to watch more uh, over the next week or two, I, I saw that, okay, he is, he is teaching the wrong thing and, and was able to give her a copy of um, the American Gospel. But the Gospel Coalition, I think this was just last week, Nathan pointed out to me, presented an article on Todd White. 
And Todd White seems to be going through a change of sorts. Um, and for the good, uh, we need to remember him in our prayers. I heard that uh, Costi Hinn is the one who, uh, nephew of Benny Hinn, one of those health, wealth, prosperity teachers. Costi has come out of that, and Costi got a hold of him and spoke to Todd White. And Todd White seems to be really struggling and dealing with what he has been involved with. But I watched a good 20 minutes of a sermon that they had on the Gospel Coalition of Todd White. Him preaching before a, a large crowd, uh, one that he would normally speak to, a, a group of people who assemble for that kind of message. And he was saying that he was going through some significant changes, some very difficult and uh, painful times. God was working on him, he said. And for the first time, out of all those sermons that I heard him preach, for the first time there on that sermon, he talked about sin and talked about our sin problem. And he said, we don't talk about that much in our circles. It made me think, made me think that God is working on him. God is illumining things. I still have a hard time watching him, uh, listening to him. He seems uh, very emotional just right from the start. This is not an endorsement. I'm not saying, hey, y'all start listening to Todd White. But it seems that God is using his word to work in this man's life. About 11 minutes into the sermon, Todd says this. He says, you, any of you guys ever read Spurgeon? And, and he's like looking for a raised hand. Spurgeon? Anybody heard of Spurgeon? He's like, this guy is blowing my mind. You know, he, he's, he's, you know, here's this guy from the 1800s, and I can't believe what I'm reading. And I, was, I sent that to my customer and said, if he's reading Spurgeon, we're on the right track, okay? He's, he's heading in the right direction. But I'm watching this, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, if you don't know, Spurgeon, one of the... One of the greatest expository biblical preachers of all time. So uh, wonderful, wonderful preacher using God's Word in a powerful way. But I'm watching this and I'm thinking, if he's being blown away by Spurgeon, his mind is being illuminated. He is beginning to see and understand biblical truths. And you see the fruit of it when he starts talking about sin, which is something that the health, wealth, prosperity crowd normally does not speak of. But God, it seems, is working on his heart. And according to our text, think about this. In many other texts in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is the agent, is the one who is doing this work of illumination. And he is using the inspired word, right? And he is using the inspired word that was revealed to the apostles and the other authors of Scripture. Spurgeon, by the way, gives us a great illustration of our constant, desperate need of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see God's truth. I love this illustration. He says, Truth may be compared to a great cave with wonderful stalactites hanging from the ceiling and others starting from the floor, a cavern glittering with glassy minerals and abounding in marvels. He says, Before entering the cavern, you inquire for a guide who comes with his flaming torch. Remember, he's from the 1800s. The word he used was flambeau. Never heard the word flambeau. I had to look it up. <laughs> I thought that was a fishing tackle box, but anyway. <laughs> he takes you down to a considerable depth, and you find yourself in the midst of the cave. He leads you through different chambers. Here, he points you to a little stream rushing from amid the rocks and indicates its rise in progress. There, he points to some peculiar rock and tells you its name. Then he takes you into a large natural hall. He tells you how many persons once served were served a feast in that room, and so on. Truth, he says, is a grand series of caverns. It is our glory to have so great and wise a guide as the Holy Spirit. Imagine that we are coming to the darkness of it. He is a light shining in the midst of us to guide us. And by the light, he shows us wondrous things. He teaches us by suggestion, direction, and illumination. We cannot discover the wisdom of God, the beauty of the gospel on our own, but God has revealed it to us 
through His Spirit. So first, let's look at Revelation. Look at verses 10 through 12. This is a good chunk, but read it with me, and then we'll go back and look at it. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Several years ago, I was driving out through Kansas on a two-day sales trip, and I decided to listen to John MacArthur's every sermon in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. Didn't want to do, deal with the, the letters. Wanted to get to the good stuff, right? No. So. <laughs> But I remember right from the beginning, starting off with Revelation, the title, I remembered him explaining what that word means, and I had written it down at the time. Um, so I flipped over to my Bible when I, when I saw this and, and saw what I had written down several years ago. Uh, the word, the Greek word is apocalyptos, which is, comes over into English as apocalypse, which means an uncovering, which means something disclosed, a disclosure. See verse 10 there? These things God has revealed, uncovered, disclosed to, to us through the Spirit. That's our word, revealed, revelation, apocalypse. What has God uncovered for us? What has God disclosed to us? These things, it says. And that points back up to the wisdom of God in Christ. The gospel of grace, for one. In fact, A.T. Robertson recognizes one of the greatest Greek scholars ever says, revealed is aorist indicative, signifying, you won't know, I'm not going to explain that, but this is what it means, signifying that this revelation had a definite beginning or advent. The word in the Greek is in such a, a form that it says this word had a beginning. It's not something that's just been going on forever, a constant flow of a river. It, it had a definite beginning. And A.T. Robertson says, revealed that there is coinciding with the entry of the gospel into the world. He has revealed this to us. It came at one time. The apostles received the revelation of God and wrote it down, the apostles and the other authors of Scripture. And as we said last week, as we began this portion, what a blessing that God has uncovered, disclosed this truth to our eyes. Notice the agent of transmission. The agent of communication here is the Spirit, was the Spirit. This is the first step of this truth making its way from the heart of God to us, into our lives. It's revelation. As a member of the Godhead, the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit knows God perfectly. This is a, this is a neat text. Because why? Because He is God. This is a text that supports the, the deity of the Holy Spirit. See the word searches there in, in 10b, the second part of verse 10? It doesn't mean that he's on the hunt. It doesn't mean that he's searching and, and looking. It means that he penetrates all things. He goes to the very depth and uncovers and knows everything. The Phillips translation has this, For nothing is hidden from the Spirit. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible, for the Spirit reaches the depths of everything. And Paul says, even the depths of God. Isn't that amazing? He knows everything about God the Father, God the Son. The Spirit shares with God the attribute of omniscience, doesn't He? He searches, He goes to the depths of everything because He is God. So we have in God's Word His perfect revelation of truth. And the Holy Spirit is the divine author of that Word. And God has used many agents, He's used many people to, to write His Word. But turn with me to 2 Second, Second Peter. 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 21. And we have something more sure. 
He was referring to first, speaking of uh, being on the mountain and seeing Jesus be transformed, uh, the majestic glory he speaks of there. But in verse 19, he says, We have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Verse 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now look at this. The Holy Spirit's insight into the mind of God is illustrated to us, is conveyed to us using an analogy from the nature of people. Look at verse 11 with me. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. No matter how well you think you know someone, no matter how close you are to that person, you do not know them completely, do you? No matter how many times we say, I know what you're thinking, <laughs> we don't always, do we? Said another way, no one can get inside the minds of others, even if they think they can. In the same way, Look at the way he's using this. Only God's own Spirit can know Him intimately. What a neat way to show, to express the intimate unity within the Trinity. He knows completely everything about God. Remember the Corinthians were taking credit for understanding the gospel, other spiritual things, thinking they had attained them by human wisdom, thinking they had arrived at them through human philosophy. And this teaching that Paul is giving right here is, a, is an axe at the root of that tree, isn't it? The root of that teaching. God reveals His wisdom through the Spirit. And remember, revealed means an uncovering. It means a disclosure. That takes away any bragging rights, doesn't it? And the Corinthians were boasting. Remember, we see that word many times. They were boasting all the time. It takes away any feelings of pride. It is all of God. Believers cannot claim any special skill. They can't claim any special insight. Only that God, in His love and in His mercy, has revealed these truths to us opened our eyes. And us, look at it there, refers to the apostles specifically, the other writers of Scripture. Look at verse 12 again. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. The we and the us there. Again, refer to the apostles and the Bible's authors who received revelation through the Spirit to write, to write God's Word. Freely given to us. See the phrase there? That is a word that most generally means giving without regard to merit. Again, no bragging rights. No, I, I've lived a, a, a holy life, a righteous life, and God looked down and He saw that I was choosing His path, and so He's illumined my path. No, without merit. Again, the mercy, the grace of God is, we, we owe it all to that. Now look at the second step of God's wisdom making its way into our lives, and that is inspiration. Look at verse 13. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Again, the word we, there in verse 13, refers to Paul, the other apostles. And notice again, Paul relentlessly contrasting this wisdom from God with human wisdom. Corinthians had a, a real problem, and that's what we all think about most often when we think of the Greeks as the, the thinker, right? <laughs> Philosophies, wisdom. 
Paul is saying, you do not come up with God's wisdom. You did not come up with and understand and comprehend and grasp the salvation message by using Aristotle or Plato or any of the other 50-some-odd competing philosophies that were out there moving around and you're all so proud of and you're all being a part of this one and that one and separating yourselves because of it. It had to be revealed to us by His Spirit, taught by the Spirit. A spirit who knows God thoroughly and is from God has brought us God's Word. And boy, that speaks to its faithfulness, doesn't it? There's no arguing that the Bible is the, the Spirit's vehicle for bringing us God's Word, God's revelation. Verse 13 speaks of inspiration. After the writers, the Bible's authors had been given the truth by revelation, by the Holy Spirit, uncovering it for them, disclosing it to them, Paul says that they were not left to themselves as to how to make a record of it. It's, it's one thing to, to know a fact, to know a, a certain fact. It's quite another thing to find the exact perfect words to, to convey that, that understanding to other people, the understanding of that fact. And that's where... The need of verbal inspiration comes in. Listen to John Piper as he paraphrases Paul's flow of thought here. He says, God gave us the Holy Spirit to reveal to us apostles things no one ever imagined. And now, in turn, as God's inspired and authoritative spokesman, we speak in words taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to spiritual people. So the way we come to know the wisdom of God is that God revealed it to the apostles by the Spirit, and they taught it to others who were prepared to receive it by that same Spirit. In our day, he says, the teaching of the apostles and the wisdom of God is thus given to us through their writings in the New Testament. It's from a sermon in 1980, The Wisdom We Speak, by Piper. This verse 13 is a clear claim to divine verbal inspiration. Paul says, my teachings are not really mine, they are God's. For the very words are taught by the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that they were machines writing down exactly what God told them to write. God was using their personality. He was using the words they knew and understood, but God was putting them in order perfectly. It brings to mind another verse, 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. God breathed words. Divine verbal inspiration. So we have revelation, and we have inspiration and finally, we have illumination. Look at verses 14 through 16. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's the third step of God's wisdom being brought to us by the Holy Spirit. Mark DeHaan once told of visiting a, a friend, a retired pastor who had a parakeet named Gibby Gibson. Uh, that parakeet could say two phrases. The first one was, Gibby Gibson is the prettiest bird in all the world. I didn't know parakeets could speak, um, could not speak, you know what I mean, could uh, repeat words. The other word that, the other phrase it could say was, Dr. Gibson is a preacher, a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Mardahan used this 
illustration, knowing that the bird could not understand a single word of what it was saying. He used this to speak about you and I going through the motions of worship, of going through the motions of, of Bible reading, and not having sometimes the slightest idea of what we're doing, but thinking that in that reading or in that time of worship, when we are totally disengaged and not really comprehending that there's something mystical happening and we are actually performing motions that, that God wants us to perform. Dahan would say this, better to read the Bible prayerfully, seeking the guidance of your paraclete. That's the word translated comforter or helper in John 14 to speak of the Holy Spirit. So better to read the Bible prayerfully, seeking the guidance of your paraclete rather than acting like a parakeet and just going through the motions. I thought that was a good illustration. Melissa liked it, even if you guys didn't. <laughs> the natural person. See verse 14, the natural person, the worldly wise man that we've been looking at here for several verses now, several weeks. The man who is living purely on a material plane without being touched by the Spirit, he or she does not accept, does not welcome. Uh, it's a word, a Greek word that, that spoke of, of uh, welcoming a guest. That person does not welcome the things of the Spirit of God. Because he's not equipped. He's not equipped to discern the activities of, of God's Spirit. They are foolishness to him. He doesn't have a translator to understand it. And look at that. Paul goes so far as to say he is not able to understand them. Because they're spiritually discerned. Discerned. That's a, that's a neat word. Acts 25, 26, I think, where Paul is standing before Festus uh, after Governor Felix. He's standing before King uh, Agrippa, I think. And, and they say, you know, I, I brought him. I've searched his whole, uh, the, whole uh, the, the, the charges against him. I can't find anything, but I thought I'd bring him to you so that we could examine him. It's, a, it's an examination before the formal trial, before the hearing. These things are spiritually discerned. A natural person cannot understand them because they are spiritually examined, scrutinized, investigated. So without the Spirit's illumination, that man is helpless. A theologian named Finlay wrote this. He said, The unspiritual are out of court as religious critics. They are deaf men judging music. That doesn't mean that they can't read and understand and comprehend the writing on the page, the concepts, but it doesn't vibrate and resonate with them. We need the Spirit's illumination. Revelation is a, is a done thing. It was revealed to the, the holy apostles. They, they wrote down God's Word. But we need illumination on a daily basis. Think about this. The psalmist Understood this, Psalm 119.18, a, a verse that we all know well. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. The psalmist had God's word. They were not taken from him and hidden somewhere. He had God's word, but he was asking for understanding, enlightenment, illumination. Martin Luther said this, Man is like a pillar of salt, like Lot's wife. He's like a log or a stone. He's like a lifeless statue which uses neither eyes nor mouth, neither senses nor heart, unless he is enlightened, converted, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit to enlighten him, to enlighten her about all things, he says. Not that we know everything, but we know everything we need to know. Look at verse 15. For the spiritual person judges all things. He knows all things. He can examine all things because he has the Holy Spirit there. Now we can walk out of step with the Spirit. We can be walking in sin and open God's Word and be totally confused and taken you know, aside by it because we're not walking in step with the Spirit. Look at the next line. But he himself is to be judged by no one. Well, that could be taken out of context, couldn't it? 
I could, I could, you can imagine someone saying, I, I, I do not stand accountable to anyone. Look, look at this verse right here. I am not responsible for my actions. I'm not to be judged by no one, right? No, it means no one. No natural person can understand the person filled with the Spirit because they cannot comprehend spiritual things. A spiritual person is impossible to figure out for the unspiritual person. Unbelievers are always trying to appraise, examine, judge, inspect, evaluate believers, and they cannot comprehend what they're seeing. They do not understand things the way a Christian, a spirit-filled person does. I had a boss once, very nice guy, who I traveled with quite a bit, and he one day he said, I, I am, what did he say? He said, I, I find your alternative lifestyle interesting. <laughs> I was like, alternative lifestyle? Where are you coming from? But look at this. Here, here is one of the, the promises, the wonderful promises in the Bible that you can claim. You will not be understood by your non-Christian friends. You will not be able to talk apples to apples with them. You will be mocked. You will be made fun of. And to some degree, you will be mistreated. You will be persecuted. You will be totally misunderstood. Verse 16. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Again, in context, just flowing from the verse before, when was the last time a non-Christian friend tried to correct your thinking? Tried to explain doctrine, biblical doctrine to you. And he got into it, or she got into it, and your response is, oh boy, where do we start? Because <laughs> you are coming at this from a totally different mindset. You know, when they're doing that, they're not arguing with you, they are arguing with God, aren't they? For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. The indwelling Spirit reveals Christ to us. And the spiritual person doesn't see things from the viewpoint of the worldly. He sees things from the viewpoint of Christ. The closer we walk with Christ, the closer we walk in step with the Spirit, the more we see things from God's point of view. Totally dependent, as we look at this, we are totally dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit, on the work of God in our lives. He has revealed through revelation. He has inspired in words taught by the Spirit, inspiration. And we cannot understand without illumination. Totally, totally at the mercy of God. Without His work in our life, we would be dead. As we look at the first chapter of Ephesians, we would be spiritually dead. We would be separated from God. We would still be His enemies. But because of His love, we are so blessed. Because of His mercy. Augustus Toplady wrote a hymn called A Debtor to Mercy. Listen to these words. A debtor to mercy alone. Of covenant mercy I sing. I come with your righteousness on my humble offering to bring. The judgments of your holy law with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. The work which your goodness began, the arm of your strength will complete. Your promise is yes and amen and never was forfeited yet. The future or things that are now, no power below or above can make your purpose forego or sever my soul from your love. My name from the palms of your hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on your heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end will endure until I bow down at your throne, forever and always secure. He repeats that three times. Forever and always secure. Forever and always secure. A debtor to mercy alone. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for this text, which at first reading through can be confusing. We, we thank you for the, the teaching that we see here. And we are totally dependent and reliant upon you for understanding, for having our eyes open to the gospel. Father, I pray that you be with each one of us here. That that which has been revealed and what you inspired the authors to write will be plain to us. We pray for our children. We pray for our grandchildren. We pray for our parents. We pray for our friends. That you would open eyes. Help them to cherish these truths. We thank you, Father, for opening ours. Pray that, again, we will live lives that are honoring to you, that we'll live lives that show we know and love these truths. We thank you for sending your Son to die in our place. We thank you for the salvation that he has won for us. And as we ready ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper, I pray that you be with each one of us, Father. Help us to not have our minds wandering, but to be thinking about what Christ did when He stepped down from the throne, when He stepped down from glory and became a man and went through so much mistreatment on our behalf. I pray that You help us to remember what He's done, remember what You've done, sending Him, and what the Holy Spirit has done, working in our lives, convicting, illumining pray for each one of us, Father, that uh, these truths will remain with us uh, for weeks to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.